with me, if you would, please, this morning to Luke chapter 10. And as you're turning there, let me encourage you, uh, as we do these memory verses, I hope it's helpful to you, but uh, we know that you won't learn a verse by saying it once every or twice, maybe a week for four weeks. But if you say this at home, and uh, particularly those of you who have children, but even those of, of us who don't, we need to get God's word in our hearts. This is a way to do it. You know, put it on a card in your pocket or whatever to review during the week. That's the whole point of what we're doing. So uh, please take advantage of the opportunity. Well, we're in Luke chapter 10, and I'm reading beginning in verse 17. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Let's pray, Father. Thank you for this word. Thank you for the opportunity to freely gather today to study and consider this as we have at the same time declared our hearts worship to you. And we pray that we will understand better uh, having been here what you have done for us and Lord, why we should rejoice. Use this time for your glory by the ministry and the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Sunday school teacher, uh, you know, had some little kids in her class, was trying to teach them the meaning of the word hallelujah, why we use that word to praise the Lord. So she got all done making this great explanation, and then she, for review, she said to the kids, all right, now, children, what do church members say when they want to express their joy? The little boy in the back said, Bingo! That's what they say. Well, we hopefully will find that our joy in Christ goes a little bit deeper than that, I hope. Uh, I trust that it will. It did for the 72 as they returned from this brief mission that God had sent them on, or that Jesus had sent them on. But even they needed a critical mid-course correction to their rejoicing. And so Jesus joins them in their joy even, even though he's on the way to Jerusalem and it's heavy on his heart, the, the pain and the suffering that he's going to go through there, but he still joins them in this rejoicing, but eventually he's going to point them to an even higher place. Now, last week we started on this. Four things in this passage we see to rejoice over. We looked at the fact that we need to be rejoice, rejoicing in our ability to serve others. This is our call. This is our mission. This is the thing that should take attention away from ourselves and point it to someone else, and in that there is great joy. Something that God has given us all abilities and he's given us careers or uh, has us in school, whatever it is that we're doing, but he wants to combine all of these things that he's given us to create a unique individual and a unique mission. So just like there are no two snowflakes that are alike, there are no two people that are alike, and our greatest joy will come in finding the mission that God has for us and in doing it and serving others. Secondly, we saw that we should rejoice in the subordination of evil. The, uh, the 72 are coming back and they're excited because they have this power over demons that they hadn't expected. And Jesus joins them in that, but he also replies that in each such victory, power over demons, the power over disease that they had, the people repenting and coming to faith in Christ, he sees Satan's empire crumbling. Of course, the ultimate victory over Satan was won by Jesus at the cross. We looked at that last week where he paid the penalty for sin and snatched any thought of ultimate victory away from Satan at that point in time. But we go through this period of time now when the Victory is assured, but the battle goes on for a while in God's providence. He allows that 
to happen. And so we get the privilege of helping come about in actual fact what he has already provided potentially. And in every soul that comes to faith in him, every temptation that is overcome, every cup of cold water that we give in Jesus' name, one more way in which the enemy is defeated and we can rejoice that we battle in a winning cause. So those we looked at last week. Now let's, this week we want to take up the third thing that we see here that we are to rejoice over, which is we rejoice in the security of believers. The security of believers. Look at verse 19. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. Well, Jesus is saying, not only are they participating in the destruction of Satan's kingdom, but Jesus adds a new cause for rejoicing. Nothing shall hurt you. That's a big promise, isn't it? That's a big promise. Let's kind of look at that verse. The word tread that's used there means to stomp or to, you know, trample on. Um, those of you who are old enough, maybe some of you who have seen a lot of reruns, remember the episode of I Love Lucy where she's somewhere in Italy and she's in this big vat and she's tromping on the grapes, right, to get the juice out of the grapes. And I forget what all she did to make that funny, but even the thought is a little bit funny. But the, this, this, is, this is the word that's used here. And if you can think of what's happening to the grapes, Jesus is saying, that's what I'm giving you power to do to the enemy. You have the power to trample the enemy. Don't be concerned about the demons and about Satan as long as your faith is placed in me. This is the power that I'm giving you to destroy serpents and scorpions. Now the big question here to start with is, well, what are serpents and scorpions, right? We know what they are literally. But what does Jesus mean when he uses that? Should we understand these literally or figuratively? Many people say we should understand them literally. They use a passage like Acts chapter 28, the last chapter in Acts. Some of you will remember there that the Apostle Paul is shipwrecked on an island. And while he's gathering firewood, a viper attaches itself to his arm. And everybody thinks, man, that guy, poor guy is gone. But Acts 28 verse 5 tells us, he, however, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. It actually turned out it gave Paul an, an audience with this people that were there. Those who think we should take serpents and scorpions literally often also point to the last verses of Mark. Mark chapter 16, verse 18, where it says they will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. And people who take that literally, presumptuously, will go out and hold worship services that feature snake handling. The idea that God will protect them. They do this despite the fact that this almost always ends badly. Somebody gets killed. I don't know if you saw it, just three or four weeks ago, there was another one in the news, another episode where somebody had gone out with this kind of claim and had, had been bitten by multiple snakes in the process of doing this kind of thing and died as a result. Almost always ends badly. Paul was being protected by God from an accidental encounter with a viper, not while putting on a show, right? Furthermore, if you check your Bible, most of you will note that there's a note somewhere in the footnote of Mark uh, 16 that will tell you that verses 9 through 20 almost certainly were not part of the original text in Mark 16. Mark seems to have ended his gospel at verse 8. So the God-breathed guarantee that attaches to Scripture ends at verse 8 and verses 9 through 20 were apparently added by some scribe later who thought that well, the ending wasn't quite conclusive enough. But even if, here's the point, even if those were Jesus' words, they would infer protection against incidental, incidental 
danger, not an invitation to put on a circus act, beloved. That's not what Jesus was about. It's not what he is about, and it's not what he's inviting us to do. But I think that several things suggest that this is actually a figurative language that's used here in any case. It's not literal serpents and scorpions that Jesus is talking about, but that it's figurative. Why do I say that? Well, let me give you four reasons. First of all, in the near context, the disciples talk about demons. Jesus, in the near context, talks about Satan. And so the implication would be that this suggests that serpents and scorpions are used here to picture the evil, the stinging, the biting, the dangerous nature of demons and Satan. Secondly, in a discussion of demons and Satan and this kind of power, the disciples' minds would almost certainly have gone back to Genesis 3, where we have the serpent coming to tempt Eve in the Garden of Eden, as you'll recall. Thus, we have biblical precedent for a serpent representing uh, demons or representing Satan in that case. In fact, this is an analogy that the Bible picks up many times. Five times in the book of Revelation, there's reference to serpents. And in every single one of those occasions, it's talking about demons. Just uses serpents as an analogy of the demons. And so it's a biblical analogy. For example, in, in Revelation 20, verse 2, we read it says, And he, that is an angel, seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil, and Satan. So it gives us a clear definition there that the serpent is used to represent that. The third thing here that I see is the subject here is victory over Satan. That's a pretty big thing, right? To suddenly introduce something like victory over scorpions and serpents might be impressive, but it's hardly in the same class as victory over Satan. It would be out of place. Finally, if we really needed the help, Jesus interprets himself. He says, behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Who's the enemy? A den of snakes? Not hardly, right? Paul tells us who the enemy is in Ephesians 6 verse 12, where he says that the enemy is the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Speaking of demonic activity, and so over that enemy, Jesus is saying, I'm giving you authority by faith. Now, in light of that, he promises, he makes that last statement in verse 19, he promises, nothing shall hurt you. Nothing shall hurt you. Man, that's, a, that's a great promise, isn't it? Nothing is gonna hurt you. And you know, it's not just given to these disciples and these followers of Jesus that are hearing him speak here. This is a promise that we can see multiple places throughout the Bible. For example, in Psalm 91, verses 10 through 12, we read this. It says, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Or how about Psalm 34 verse seven, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Or even later on in Luke, in Luke chapter 21 verse 18, Jesus says, but not a hair of your head will perish. Nothing can hurt you. Not a hair of your head will perish. I mean, these are scandalous promises, are they not? And yet, we know from the vantage point of history, that all 11 of the apostles, less Judas, were severely persecuted, and all of them suffered martyrs' deaths, except John, who was also severely persecuted. So did Jesus' promise of security fail? I mean, is the insurance policy void? Of course, the answer to that question is absolutely not. The word of God never fails. The word that Jesus gives never fails. So what gives? Well, what gives is this. God has a much broader perspective than we do, right? We think of everything in terms of the 
these little 70 or 80 years that we're going to live here. God thinks in terms of an infinite eternity. And so the promise here is not that you'll never suffer any physical harm, but it's that there will never be pain without purpose. It's that there will be meaning in suffering. Look, beloved, it's, it's kind of like this. We think suffering is incompatible with victory over Satan. It's not. It's not. In fact, sometimes suffering is the very means of victory over the enemy. Prime example is Jesus himself, right? Jesus comes, many purposes for his coming as we come to the time of the Christmas season and the incarnation. Many, many of us will be in different places where we'll hear some of the reasons that Jesus gives for coming. One of them is in 1 John 3, 8, where, Jesus, where John says this about Jesus. He says, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. So Jesus came to destroy the devil. How did he do that? Did he just grab him by the scuff of the neck and pull him off the stage and say, you're gone? He didn't do that, did he? Could he have done that? Of course. Had he done that, guess who goes with him? You and me and everybody else who ever rebelled against the Father. So Jesus did it in a different way. Jesus destroyed Satan in an absolutely opposite way than we would have ever thought. He destroyed Satan by dying. Weakness, suffering, death was the means by which he brought defeat to Satan. Hebrews chapter two, verse 14. If you don't know this verse, you need to be acquainted with it. It says that God became a man in the person of Christ that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death. That is the devil. Through death he destroyed him. Jesus destroyed Satan on the cross, but how can that be? Well, it could be because number one, the, the perfect son of God was there taking upon himself the sin of the whole world that Satan had managed to get everybody enslaved in, right? It could be because Jesus was there taking the wrath of the Father against all of the sin that we've committed. It could be because after three days, Jesus rose again, giving assurance that the work that he had done on the cross was accepted by the Father and payment for what we owed to him. That's how it could be. And so with that resurrection, Satan was destroyed. And the prophecy that went way back to the first sin in Genesis 3.15 that said there's gonna be a redeemer who comes and Satan will be able to bruise his heel, but he will bruise Satan's head is exactly what happened on the cross. Through pain and through suffering, the destruction of the enemy was achieved and now he allows us the privilege to actualize the destruction of Satan by sharing in his sufferings. That's why Paul was so anxious to fill up the sufferings of Christ. He said, I, I want to be part of that. When Jesus says, not a hair of your head will perish, beloved, he means even if you die, you will not perish. When Jesus says nothing will hurt you, he means nothing can ever happen to your ultimate detriment. Nothing. If you belong to him, if you are in Christ, in light of eternity, not a hair of your head can perish. In light of eternity, nothing can hurt what you have in Christ. You cannot be damaged eternally. That's what this promise is about. He will build a hedge around you. He does. When people come to Christ, he builds a hedge around us, just like he built around Job. That means even if you suffer some physical pain here in this life, it will be for God's glory and for your good, whatever that may be. This is like no other insurance policy anywhere. No one else offers this. From a human perspective, I grant you, it looks all wrong. Does it not? It looks all wrong. 
The early church discovered that. Turn with me to Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12, as the church is getting off the ground after Jesus has, been, has died and then been resurrected and then ascended back to the Father, the church begins to get off the ground through the power and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the lives of these people. But it's not all roses, right? In fact, there's persecution from the very beginning, just like Jesus said there would be. And some of it comes to a head in Acts chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. It says, about that time, Herod, the king, laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Now think about that for a moment. James was one of the three men who was part of the inner circle around Jesus, right? Peter, James, and John. This is the same James. James was a man in whom Jesus had invested three years of his life to train him for the mission and for the ministry that was to come. James was one who was standing there when Jesus made the promise, not a hair of your head shall perish. And when he made the promise, nothing shall hurt you. And yet there lies James in the, in the ground, dead. So what is the promise? Void. Of course not, beloved. James, think about it. Get the big picture now. James is celebrating in heaven before his head hits the ground on earth, right? We're just too limited in our perspective. Another nail was hammered in the coffin of the enemy because God used the death of James to spread the disciples because of the persecution to go out and do what he had told them to do in the first place, which was to go into all the world and spread the gospel to every creature, right? James' death was part of the thing that incentivized them to get going. Now notice verse 3 of Acts chapter 12 if you're there. It says, and when he, Herod, saw that it pleased the Jews, so he had some happy people when he killed James, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. If once is good, twice should be better. Right? That's his philosophy, good politician. But what happened? We know what happened with Peter. The church prayed. Peter was released. He showed up at the house where they were praying. They said, go away. It can't be you. <laughs> you know, we don't really believe that God's going to answer our prayers. And Peter says, no, I'm not a ghost. It's really me. And he walks in and, and, and God delivered Peter. But he let James die. Why? Sovereignty of God, beloved. His ways are not our ways. His ways aren't the same any two times. If we haven't learned that, we need to learn that. What he's saying to us is, look, don't trust my ways. Don't trust how I did it for somebody else. Don't trust anything except trust me. Trust me. Trust me. Whatever I'm doing in your life, whatever I'm allowing in your life, whatever's going on in your life, trust me. God doesn't promise physical safety, but God's promise guarantees eternal safety. We're far better off in his hands than we are with all state, Right? Far better. The security that God provides to those who love him. I love this uh, joke about the uh, golfer who hits his ball astray, like some of us do. And it went into an anthill, right? And so he goes over, he's, he's got to get his ball out of there. He swings mightily, misses the ball, kills thousands of ants. Swings again kills another bunch of ants, and finally another time, and still he's just killing ants, the ball sits there. Finally, there's only two ants left. One of them hollers to the other, you know what, if we're going to get out of here alive, we better get on the ball. <laughs> they had it figured out, right? <laughs> we better get on the ball. Well, beloved, this is, this is what it means to belong to God. This is what it means to be in Christ. You're on the ball. The, the, the dome of his protection has descended around you when you come to Christ. The invisible arms of the Father who loves you have surrounded you. And nothing can touch you that he does not allow. And nothing can ever harm you eternally. Not a hair of your head will perish. Nothing will hurt you. That's a cause for rejoicing, is it not? It's a great thing to be in Christ. 
Well, one more thing. Rejoice in salvation is Jesus' final word in this passage. This is where he's issuing a solemn warning. This is kind of like a red flag in a sense going up. There's a danger. This is the mid-course correction. See, there's a danger that our joy may, may, may settle below the pinnacle of where it ought to be. It's a danger that we can that we can get enamored of the things that are less than the ultimate. And so Jesus says in verse 20, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you. Wouldn't you think that's a great thing? You can just go cast out any spirit anywhere you want to. Jesus says, don't rejoice in that. That's, that's way too small. Rejoice in this, that your names are written in heaven. Don't get enamored with lesser things things. Get enamored with the great things, with the ultimate things. You know, he's, he's, he's happy to see his disciples rejoicing in the success of their ministry. He even joins them in rejoicing in the success of their ministry, but he warns them, don't let this be where you stop. Get to the top. He's saying to them, in essence, guys, this is great that the demons are subject to you. It's but don't stop there. This is nothing compared to the fact that your names are written in heaven. Revel in that. Everything else stems from that. Everything else comes from that. Jesus knows, does he not? He knows how easily we get enamored with the blessings rather than the blesser. He knows our penchant to love the miracles rather than the miracle giver. So he points them higher. He points them away from the mundane to that which is truly spectacular. Your names are written in heaven. Wow. You know, the background of this is every city in that time had a, had a role of citizens, right? And if you became a citizen of a locale, your name was written there. And it was important to have your name written there because all the rights and privileges and everything else that, that you got as a citizen could only be yours if your name was written on that roll. And Jesus is reminding them, saying to them, guys, listen, your names are written in the most privileged place in the universe with all the rights and privileges that go with that. Your names are written in heaven. Get perspective. You're taking it for granted. Here's how critical it is that your names are written in heaven. Turn with me to Revelation 20. Last book in the Bible, almost the last chapter, not quite. Revelation 20. In this passage, John is giving us a description of what the final judgment will look like, the final judgment of unbelievers. He says in Revelation 20, beginning of verse 12, I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. It's that book of life that Jesus is talking about when he says, rejoice that your names are written in heaven, because at the final judgment, that's the book that's gonna be checked first. As unbelievers come before the great white throne, it's gonna be checked to see is your name there. And if it's not, then the other books are open. What are the other books? The other books are the record, the, the entire record of the life of the individual who's in the dock at that point in time, every thought, every word, every deed, every motivation, everything will be there. And they will have an opportunity to show that while they're not written in the book of life, perhaps their goodness meets God's standard of perfection. God is not unfair, beloved. But of course, no person will ever be able to do that. We all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. We all cannot possibly stand and say we're as perfect as 
God himself. And so the judgment will fall. And the fate is sealed, as it says in verse 15 there in Revelation 20, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown in a lake of fire. This is why Jesus is saying it's important that your name is written in the book of life. Your name is written in heaven because those who don't will be shown to fall short of the goodness and the glory of God. You say, well, don't we fall short of the glory of God with our goodness as well? Absolutely. But what's the difference? The difference is those whose names are written in the book have been covered by the righteousness of Christ. The words of, of Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 21, he became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. When God looks at us, he doesn't see us, he sees the righteousness of Christ. That's why it's important that your name be written in the book. For those written in the book, those names who is written in heaven, there is no judgment to determine final eternal destiny. Say, so how do you know that? Because the Bible says so. We learned one of the verses a few weeks ago, right? Romans 8.1. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus says in John 5, 24, truly I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. Listen, beloved, we're all born under a death sentence. We're all born under a death sentence. We're sinners by nature, and then we prove it by sinning every day in our own, in our own right. But for those who have come to faith in Christ, we have passed from death into life. The death sentence has been lifted. The forgiveness of sin has been granted. The door to eternity has been opened, and we have passed from death into life. We have passed from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. That's what happens the moment you invite Jesus into your life. So, is that the moment, that moment when you come to faith in Christ, is that the moment when your name is written in heaven? Is that the, name, the, the moment when, it's, when, when, when you are entered into the book of life? The answer to that question may surprise you because the answer is no, it's not. So you say, well, when, when did that happen? Turn back to, if you're in Revelation still, turn back to the 13th chapter. Revelation 13. Revelation 13 and verse eight describes those who will continue to reject Christ in the last days that are being described here in Revelation 13. And, and con concerning those, John says that those who continue to re reject Christ, everyone whose name was not written, has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the lamb that was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. So when was your name written in the book? It was written in the book long before the universe ever began. Certainly long before you were born, long before you ever thought about, long before the world was ever thought about what God both knew and determined before time began. He wrote into the book of life. If you're a believer, he knew your name long before you were ever born. <clears throat> Ephesians 1.4 says it this way. It says, even as he chose us in him before the foundation the world. See, that sounds like Calvinism. No, it sounds like the Bible. That's where we're getting it. God shows you before you ever breathed, before the universe was ever created. But beloved, here's the thing. What, what God has known from eternity still has to be worked out in time. And what God has already put into the book has to be accepted by us, combining his sovereignty, now listen closely, combining his sovereignty with our freedom to choose in a way known only to him. You say, how do you put those together? I, I gave up trying years ago. I don't know. 
All I know is they're both true. And so in time, we have to accept what God has already given us. To accept the gift of life. And let me tell you, the moment when we do that is precious to the Father. Precious to the Father. Listen to this in Luke 15, verse 10. This is Jesus talking. He says, just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels in heaven over one sinner who repents. That's freedom of choice, isn't it? That's free will. But that tells us God is really happy when that happens. It's a cause for rejoicing. I used to work for a company that made automated fingerprint identification equipment. APHIS. You've all seen it and heard about it on the cop shows by now, right? When that technology came on board in the mid-80s, it was revolutionary. Think about it this way. You know, we used to, you get the idea, well, they pick up a, a, a print from a crime scene and they go find it in their database. Well, think about that for a second. Think about an agency that has a million records in its database. That means there's 10 million fingerprints in that database. You think when somebody comes and robs your house that they're going out and comparing that single little fingerprint with those 10 million fingers in the database? I got news for you. They probably made it look good by taking a fingerprint, but they didn't in those days go search it against 10 million fingers. It would have taken years to do that. But when this automated technology came along, which has evolved over time to become quite impressive today, but when that te technology came along, suddenly they could take a crime scene fingerprint, and they could compare it against those 10 million finger, fingerprints in a matter of, it, originally in a matter of a few hours, now it's seconds that they can do that. And they can actually accomplish, it's a wonderful accomplishment. So in those early days in our company, what we used to do is, every time somebody from a, from a, from a, uh, a police organization got a, a hit and caught a criminal because they, caught, because they used the fingerprint using our system, they, they would call in and we would ring a bell in our company that would be heard throughout the company. We wanted everybody to know that all the work was paying off. Let me tell you, it was, a, it was a huge motivator. People loved it. We did it until we were ringing the bell so often that you know, it was distracting as the technology developed. But beloved, that's just multiply that by a billion times and you see what it's like in heaven when someone comes to faith in Christ. It's a big deal to have your name written in heaven. But look at, if, you, if you're not there, go, go to Luke 15, verse 10. Look at that verse one more time. Luke 15, verse 10. Jesus says, just so I tell you, Luke 15, 10, just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And I used to read that verse and I used to think, oh, so the angels are all rejoicing because somebody came to faith in Christ. And no doubt they are. But look, at the, look how it reads again. It says there is joy not among the angels, but before the angels, before the angels. The word before that's there means in the face of or in front of or in sight of. In other words, somebody is rejoicing in the presence of, in front of. In the side of the angels, he's not saying the angels are rejoicing, although they may well be, but somebody else is rejoicing in front of them. So who's that? Other believers who are already in heaven, probably, but I don't think that's the emphasis in this verse. There's a wonderful verse that we don't pay much attention to in Zechariah, I'm sorry, Zephaniah 3, verse 17. Zephaniah 3, 17. It's the fourth book, you know, before the end of the Old Testament, if you want to look it up. Zephaniah 3.17, listen to this. As soon as I get there. It says, the Lord your God is in your midst. A mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. That verse still staggers me. The picture there 
is that when someone comes to faith in Christ that he has prompted in the first place, but that somehow our free choice and free will has been married together with his sovereignty to bring about our salvation at that point in time, God himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are singing together with rejoicing. I think that's what Jesus is saying in Luke 15, 10. There's a, there's a holy trio singing in heaven, rejoicing over the salvation of a single person. You begin to see why nothing compares to having your name written in heaven, beloved. The truth is God exalts over us more than we exalt over him by far. It's, a, it's kind of a travesty, really. should be the other way around. That's why Jesus says, though, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Don't stop below the ultimate. I mean, it's okay to rejoice over the blessings of God, but somewhere along the line, leave them behind and rejoice over the really important thing, that you belong to the Father, that you're part of the family. We need a daily dose of that. So, a brilliant young lady crammed four years of high school into three years, still graduated at the top of her class. Tough act to follow for her younger sister who came along about three years later. She graduated in four years, had very average grades. There wasn't anything extraordinary about her. Well, 20 years later, she went back for a class reunion. And as she came up to a couple of the older teachers who had been there that whole time, she could tell, she thought they looked like they might recognize her. So she, she said, do you know who I am? And they said, yes, you're one of the barber girls. She said, do you know which one? Well, they kind of put their heads together, you know, for a minute, and then they came up and they said, you're the other one. You're the other one. Nobody wants to be the other one. You're not the other one. If you belong to Christ, beloved, you're the one. There are no other ones in heaven. God told Moses, I know your name. God says in Revelation that all those who belong to him, he's going to give them a new name that nobody knows. He knows every one of his children by name. He's written every one in his book. It's a passage in Psalms that talks about the fact that he's got our names written on the palms of his hands. So, is your name in the book? You say, well, what can I do about that? If my name's there, it's there. If it's not, it's not. And that's true. And from God's side, it's a done deal. But listen, from your side, you can't do anything about God, but you can do something about you. You can affirm whether your name is in his book by coming to him in faith, repenting your sin, accepting him into your life, and be part of the family. Affirming, proving, demonstrating that your name is really written there. Say, what if it's not? Let me clue you. Most people who are worried about whether their name is there or not, their name is. They just haven't come to faith in Christ yet. It's time to come. People whose name isn't written there don't spend much time worrying about it. Come to Christ. That's your part. He's done his part. Time for us to do ours. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for giving us something so powerful to rejoice over. Lord, in the darkest moments of our life, I pray that you will somehow help us to remember this. I belong to God. My name is written in heaven. He knows who I am. Wow. Can't get any better than that. And so, Lord, help us on a daily, daily basis to thank you for that, to rejoice in that, to join you in enjoying us by enjoying you. May it be true, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.